So over the, the course of the past few years, I've had the pleasure and good fortune to get to know former Kentucky Governor John Y. Brown, Jr. He, he is one of my patients, and he is an incredible heart survivor, living a long, healthy life. So the governor's heart issue began years ago in 1983, his final year in office. High stress, uh, lack of sleep, poor health habits all came to bear a price on him. And in late June of that year, after attending a cabinet retreat at Lake Barkley, and upon returning to the Capitol, he had some serious uh, heart symptoms, chest pain. He was rushed to the hospital in Frankfurt and then quickly transferred to Lexington. Uh, had a heart catheterization, numerous blockages were discovered. So the governor had to have heart surgery, and that was early in the years of open heart surgery, and it was not the, what it is today, very, very serious and life-threatening uh, at that time. So he had heart surgery, and while in the hospital, he had a complication uh, that is called ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. That alone is a life-threatening uh, problem, a couple of that with, with heart surgery. So he had a very prolonged hospital course. Uh, lung issues were extremely serious for the governor. He was sedated heavily and slipped into a coma. He was then placed in an oxygen tent. And Lexington businessman W.T. Young sent his private plane to Colorado to bring the nation's leading lung expert to Lexington for a consultation on the governor. He was indeed in critical condition. His family, his friends, and his cabinet all held vigil at the hospital. His wife, Phyllis, was pregnant with their second child, Pamela. She tried to keep some sense of normalcy for their young son, Lincoln. The governor's treatment was very intense, and after three weeks, he finally began to recover. He was eager to get back home and get back to work, and he asked his state trooper detail to take him home. They waited for the doctors to clear this idea and then took the governor home. He was dismissed from the hospital after a month. A month in the hospital is an incredible long time and absolutely a life-threatening situation. He continued his recovery at home. It went more quickly than anticipated, and he was able to finish out his term as governor. Right then and there, uh, the governor decided to make many lifestyle changes. He quit smoking, quit drinking, began to eat better, and began to exercise. He set the stage with this healthy foundation for totally changing the trajectory of his life and now has lived a long and very healthy life. He is now 86 years young and tries to live this healthier lifestyle every day. When I first met the governor, I was just amazed at, because I knew about the history from years and years ago of how fantastic his heart was at many, many years later after having extensive heart work. Recently, some of Governor Brown's closest friends gathered to pay tribute to their good friend. When one thinks of John Y. Brown, a series of uh, interesting images come to mind. It's things that uh, would lead to a book to be written, a movie possibly to be made. It's a story of a young Kentucky man from modest Kentucky beginnings who had a desire to achieve, desire to become better than himself. Making a difference was important to him. I think John Y. Brown is one of the greatest, if not best, entrepreneurs in the history of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I don't know of anybody who had a greater vision, which is the key to entrepreneurship, than he did once he met Colonel Sanders and decided to make Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken a national and international brand.
It has been said about John White that he is a great risk taker, never afraid of a risk. Tonight is real proof that that is true. He has invited me, his ex-wife, as his guest at a dinner to honor him and given me a microphone to say whatever I choose to this <laughs> crowd of people. A lot of people would think that's a risk. He has a great imagination and he's a great thinker with great ideas. I mean, who thinks up putting fried chicken in a bucket, selling it out a window, and you take it home and eat it? Rescue a professional basketball team by making an all-woman board of directors and telling your wife she can manage this. John Y. defeated me on something I'd worked all my life trying to get ready for. He defeated me, but he beat me fair and square. I didn't look back, and we've been friends ever since. And he's one of the best people I've ever been around. Uh, no one did a better job as governor of Kentucky than he did, and he did it very simply by hiring people, as he says, that were better than he was around him, and that's the key to the success of great CEOs and even greater entrepreneurs. I don't know how John is here today other than through the grace of God and the American Heart Association. Uh, the ability that uh, John had to get through a serious heart issue uh, when he was governor almost died, uh, life was saved by technology. The surgery was so hard for him. A lot of after effects, and it was a very scary time. After he had recovered, I went to see him and I asked him, do you feel fragile now after all that frightening time of being so ill? And he was like, no, I feel like I have a second life and I'm ready to go. John Y. Brown is one of my very best friends and has been for years and years and years. He comes over to my house three or four times a week, eats all my ice cream. And if, if I'm privileged enough to have some sweet lady bring me a cherry pie or an apple pie, he not only will eat one piece, he will eat two pieces and then he will ask for an extra dip of ice cream. And I said, John, why, you're no longer the governor. The thing that's carried <laughs> him all of his life has been his personality and his salesmanship. And uh, that's the thing I think that draws all of us to him. He's enjoyed everything that he's had to do. People say to me, uh, he worked so hard during those years. What was your family life like? We have three amazing children who are obviously all adults now, and they have given us nine amazing grandchildren. Recently, I had a major birthday. He called to say happy birthday, and he said, who ever thought it was gonna be so much fun to be this old? And who ever thought we were gonna live this long? But Beside all of this hoopla about John Y, one of the things that I feel is so important about him, John Y is the same kind, cordial, gracious gentleman that we have always known. So tonight, I hope you will join with us and honoring and congratulating him on being the Kentucky Heart Association's Man of the Year. But for all of the rest of us that are here, he will always be our Man of the Year every year. Please welcome Governor Brown's son, Lincoln Brown. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Skinner, for the nice words. Uh, my dad has certainly had a, a very accomplished career and contributed to the well-being of many, but uh, for Pamela and I, at least, uh, we grew up after a lot of the uh, highlights you just saw from his career. And so for us, most of our experience, um, you know, his professional achievements were secondary to who he was as a father. So in introducing my dad tonight, I want to share a little bit about John Y. Brown Jr. in a more human way and how he was as a father to us. First, of all the awards I thought my dad may ever receive, one that signifies a lifetime pursuit of health and wellness, such as the American Heart Association, <laughs> certainly was not one of them. <laughs> you all said some nice words in there, but you know that was marketing. Um, <laughs> On the AHA website, if you read, it says for a strong heart, it recommends a healthy diet, exercise, and moderating stress, none of which describes my father. <laughs> I've been so the last few years. You're doing a little better. Um, so let me give you a glimpse of just how diligent his health routine was over the years. Let's start with his all-American diet. My first memory that came to mind was any time you got in his car. If you peeked in the back seat where there's like a little trash can there, you named the fast food restaurant and it was well represented. <laughs> Big Mac, Whopper, Blizzard from Dairy Queen, and of course, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> it's true. Further, I always remember Thanksgiving meals. It was like a seven layer cake of stuffing and potatoes and gravy and anything bad you could eat to where it almost like fell off the plate and he would go back for seconds. And while he quit drinking 33 years ago, to his credit, that was true. Uh, as I understand it, he was never shy with the bourbon. So you must think, well, he must have had a great exercise routine. So I thought back to my memories of him exercising and I don't have one. <laughs> The only time I remember him ever going to a fitness facility was shortly after he and my mom divorced and he had met a woman who went to the gym. And <laughs> so he started going every day for the next couple weeks. I was in high school and I said, Dad, what do you do there? And he said, uh, honey, I'm not really sure. I, I just go from machine to machine and fake it until I get a chance to talk to her. All true. <laughs> Lastly, moderating stress. Well, let's just say my dad loves the action. Fast-paced lifestyle and jet-setting life. There was never any nine to five work hours or any normalcy growing up. He's had plenty of highs and lows in business, as any entrepreneur does. Um, a few marriages, including Miss Sweet Ellie, who's here tonight, and uh, an amazing lady and part of our family. Um, and he liked to bet on a game or two or play some poker. And these are not $20 bets, but we won't talk about that, Dad. Uh, so the moral of the story is, for everyone in the crowd tonight, is if you love fast food, you love to drink bourbon, and you hate to exercise, you too could be the honoree at the American Heart Association. <laughs> In all seriousness, you must wonder how at 86, he's still so vibrant, so alert, and has hardly lost a step. And while we all know good genes matter, that is not the key to his well-being. I'll tell you what it is. In addition to great doctors like Dr. Skinner, uh, I know of no one who has had a more positive mental outlook, regardless of circumstance, than my dad. No matter how hard, <laughs> true. No matter how hard the defeat or the consequence, give dad a few days and he's focusing on the positive. Every new business had the chance to be the next Kentucky Fried Chicken. Every failure, in his words, was just a stepping stone to success, no big deal. He'd always tell me there's no, no use in worrying, you can't do anything about it. And he's always had a great sense of humor. Uh, this past Monday, I got back from work at 1.30 a.m. and dad calls and I said, dad, what are you doing up this late? This is a true story. He said, well, honey, I got stuck in the bathtub again. I couldn't get out, but I'm okay. Don't you worry about me. I've got someone to come lift me out. He'll be here in about 20 minutes, but 
I just want to tell you, I've, been, I've had a chance to catch up on all the latest news, and what a great world you live in, son. It's just so exciting. <laughs> Didn't bother him at all. He's stuck in the bathtub, you know, just, just, just another night. I recently asked Dad, I said, well, where does this trait come from? You know, he said, I think maybe growing up the way I did. He said, uh, Papa, who's my grandfather, his dad, uh, he's a great man, but he lost 15 elections. And every night, or every day, after he lost, he'd wake up the next morning like nothing happened, and he would just forge on. It's just how he was wired. So he said, you get used to it, you get knocked down, you get back up, and you just fight harder the next time. And that's how he's lived his life. So maybe one day, Dad, in your honor, the American Heart Association will change the website to recognize how important a positive mental attitude is. That worry doesn't serve any of us to give each day everything you have and to shoot for the stars, because that's how you've lived your life. Lastly, we made a quick highlight video for you to, to introduce you tonight, give a quick snapshot into our daily text thread between Pam, Dad, and I. We have a rule that every night before he goes to bed, he has to send us a selfie and he has to exercise. So we've got a few great outtakes for you. I walked three quarters of a mile, it's pretty good. It's a beautiful day. Hope you're having a good day. Life is good, okay? Let's go for it. All right, see ya. I'm so proud to introduce my dad tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, in the spirit of the American Heart Association's new impact goal of living longer, healthier lives, Governor Brown would like to acknowledge a number of his friends in attendance tonight. These Central Kentucky leaders include Ted Bassett, Foster Ackerman Sr., Isabel Yates, Sue Wiley, Jim and Pat Host, Terry McBrayer, and Humsey Yesen. Thank you all. I want to thank the <clears throat> election in the chapter of the American Heart Association for knowing, for allowing me to be this year's honoree for their annual 
I think, very exciting fundraising event. I'm proud because this is my hometown, and I'm proud because I've got a story that I think can help people. I'm being honored tonight for being bad. <laughs> 37 years ago, I had a freeway bypass. Dr. Skinner didn't mention it, but 31 years ago, I also had another bypass. My message tonight is it's never too late to change. If you all watched the Kentucky basketball game today, <laughs> a lot like my life. In my last quarter of my life, uh, I was 17 points behind. And today, they had a miracle. And it's a miracle I'm standing here tonight. Now, they made a lot of fun of my eating habits and all that, but I'll correct that as we go along. <laughs> I invited some Lexington community leaders who were in their 80s and 90s to be with us tonight because they're great role models. Two of them, Ted Bassett and Foster Ackerman, fought in World War II. Have any of you ever met someone in World War II? <laughs> Ted is a rock star of motivation and inspiration. And my dear friend, I'll have breakfast with him maybe twice a week at Keeneland just to get motivated with his enthusiasm. Ted um, Foster is, uh, will reach 100 years later this year. He played tennis daily till two years ago when his playing partners all passed away. <laughs> my younger son, Lincoln, is my story of change, solely. When he was seven years old, he looked up at me and said, Dad, you're a lot older than all the dads of my friends, 20 years at least. So you have to be around a long time for me. And thinking back, that was four years after he saw me in the hospital of what Dr. Skinner explained. And that I'm sure has been a part of his motivation ever since. For 33 years, he has motivated me. When I heard that, it shook me in, got my attention shortly thereafter, within a month. I gave up smoking and drinking cold turkey. Never thought I would, but I did. I'm glad I did. Pam tells a story that uh, when Lincoln was 10, he put up a dog gate at the door of the kitchen at Cave Hill because I would get up every night at midnight to go get my ice cream like Terry would say. But I couldn't get in, I couldn't crawl under, and I couldn't jump over. <laughs> For 33 years, Lincoln has continuously encouraged me, I would say on a weekly basis, because I don't think that memory ever left him when I was in the UK hospital surviving. His love and concern made me live up to his expectations. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. Thank you, Lincoln. I love you. You've motivated me every day that you've been when you were seven years old or three years old. Uh, Dr. Skinner, I'd like to give a shout out to you because you've been very helpful. You and Sarah being the chairman of this wonderful event, best look at women I've ever seen dressed in red. <laughs> also, I'd like to have a shout out to my doctor after my heart problems. He was unbelievable. He was Jim Borders, Dr. Jim Borders. He was my doctor for 25 years. He always gave me confidence, gave me solutions, gave me knowledge. Not that I followed it, but <laughs> he was there to correct any problems I ran into along the way. After 25 years, he informed me that he was at to leave. He was offered the top job at the Baptist Hospital. I thought, oh my gosh, what I do? He said, don't worry, I got your back. I've got a twin brother that's got an office here uh, that's gonna take care of you. And I went to Dr. John Borders. I couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> they were both great. Be like, you know, losing a wife and 
catching up with her twin sister and moving on. <laughs> I want to take just a minute to introduce my great family. They're so special. They've been my inspiration for many, many years. My oldest son is John Von Brown III, graduate of UK Law School, all A student, and uh, was Secretary of State for eight years, eight proud years, one of the most popular people in Frankfurt and working with state government as a business consultant the last 20 years. My oldest daughter is Sissy, teacher for 30 years, been teaching in Fayette County School for 20 years at Lansdowne, and loves her career. In fact, she was a uh, part of all that uh, complaining in the governor's feet last year. <laughs> Has two proud children. My baby daughter of my first family is Sandy, uh, a very successful developer in Louisville, along with her husband, Tony, proud mother and the father of four great children. Tonight, I have 10 grandchildren here. Four of them are here, are four, 10 grandchildren, two of which Pam just recently had in the last couple of years. And then Lincoln, uh, youngest son in my second part of life. And uh, he went to Wharton Business School. Uh, he's highly disciplined. He went out in the last 10 years and along with a partner built a very successful Start company in Silicon Valley. Uh, came back here a couple of years ago with me with his mom and me. And uh, just this week was written up in the New York Times a major article about Mayor Bloomberg's major technology program that Lincoln was one of the leaders of. And since uh, President, uh, I mean, former President candidate of Bloomberg didn't make it, the, the Biden people have been all over him to come in there and help set it up for them because they think it'll revolutionize the democratic way of communication. The American Heart Association, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't want to forget this. This is the best part. Two years ago, I attended Go Red for Women, and again last year. I love the passion and the energy that they showed. They were at war with heart disease and how to fight it. High inspiration. They cared. Muhammad Ali's daughter gave a knockout keynote message. The American Heart Association work does timely and reliable research about heart disease, but also offers advice at the grassroots level where our community has been inspired of how to fight and how to defeat this life challenge. The, I understand our election chapter here of the American Heart Association and one of the best in the country. Uh, for uh, and one of the best in the country for a town our size. The Heart Association reports that 48 percent of people will have heart disease at some time in their life, and a like number will die from heart disease. I'd like to give a round of applause, if we would, to all the people here tonight and the commitment you've given to your Lexington chapter that is one of the best in the country. Let's have a round of applause for yourself. The important news tonight is that 80% of heart disease is preventable, or I wouldn't be here. Think about that. That's our wake-up call. It's never too late to change. It's safe to say all of us in this room tonight have been affected by heart disease or stroke of a family member, a relative, or yourself perhaps as a survivor. Many of you work on the front lines in hospitals, doctor's offices, caring for patients that perhaps have very difficult challenges to make. The Heart Association is almost 100 years old has raised over $4 billion for medical research and education of the public about this treacherous disease. It's, they've had a tremendous impact. I salute you again for what the work you do. Uh, may we give you 
I'm sorry, I've already said that. Uh, they say the main challenge to heart disease is healthy eating and proper exercise. I learned that that's very complex, takes a lot of discipline and a lot of learning. I never thought I would ever eat healthy. Uh, I remember back in my time in the late 70s, they tried to introduce healthy food with that god-awful salad dressing <laughs> that we all had to try to get up, and if that's it, I want no part of it. But once you learn, you'll really enjoy it and feel better and healthy after each meal, and you sleep better. I promise, I've learned the hard way. I was once the leader of the world's largest fast food company, bigger than McDonald's. If I can overcome that career, two heart attacks 37 and 31 years ago, there's hope for us all. Do you all hear that? <laughs> I'm still standing up here. I'm very fortunate to live with Mary Ellen Wheeler, who knows the importance of healthy food. All of that stuff, Himalayan salt, special kinds of sugar and tea, glutton-free or gluten-free, whatever they call it. <laughs> That's all I find in the kitchen. <laughs> healthy food that tastes good and you feel better. What more can you ask for? Over the years, every time I bring fast food or fried chicken home and put it in the refrigerator, she throws it in the garbage. <laughs> I got one of my damn pages mixed up here. How'd that happen? <laughs> uh, oh. Anyway. My advice to you men, find a woman. <laughs> they know about food. They raise children, how to eat. They care about you. They want you to live a long time. They love you, and they like being the boss. <laughs> You'll never see a bunch of men on stage raising hell about heart disease like Gold Red for Women. Later in life, I found walking was my best exercise at least three times a week the last 10 years. It wasn't pretty, but it worked. Tonight I speak to you as, let me say that again, I speak to you as your governor. <laughs> Y'all listen up and pay attention, all right? It's real simple. It's all about good habits. Being consistent every day. It's about eating and exercise. If you don't do it every day, if you don't eat right every day, if you don't exercise some every day, then it won't work. The Boy Scouts teach us simply, plan your work and work your plan. That's the deal. If you want to live long, that's it. That's all I learned. And I did better on eating food, and I have exercise. And he's walking. Me, I do I eat ice cream more than I should sometimes at French house. I can't eat it at home. And, and thank you, Mary Ellen, okay? Life is the greatest gift that we can ever have. It's healthy lives, that's why we're here. That's why you all support this great cause. That's the joy and the excitement that we have to wake up sometimes and realize, man, this living is the best thing that ever happened to us. And I wanna thank you all for allowing me to share and I hope it makes an impression because I wouldn't be here. I was the worst candidate possible. I never thought about diet and or exercise because I always felt good. And I've been very fortunate to get a lot of help and a lot of support. And I appreciate the opportunity. I want to leave you with a quote. But you might put on some kind of memo in your home or in the mirror. And it's very simply, 
In time, take time, while time does last. For time is no time when time is past. Okay, let's go celebrate life. Ladies and gentlemen, in honor of Governor John Y. Brown, Jr., please welcome Tevin Vincent to sing My Old Kentucky Home. The sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home. Tis summer, the people are gay. The corn tops ripe and the meadows in the bloom While the birds make music all the day The young folks roll on the little cabin floor All happy, all merry and bright by and by, hard times comes a knocking at your door. Then my old Kentucky home could night. Weep no more, my lady. Oh, weep no more today. Or will sing one song for my old Kentucky home. For my old Kentucky home. For 